உங்கள் டிவி Welcome to Crossroads on TVI, a show that showcases the Tamil Canadian community, their issues and their successes. I'm your host, Manjula Salvaraja. On our show today, we will speak to people who are telling survivor stories from Vanni, former UN worker Benjamin Dix and author Francis Harrison. But before we get started, let's take a look at this video. In 2009, the civil war fought between the Sri Lankan army and the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam reached a climax. In one of the most brutal counterinsurgency operations ever mounted, at least 40,000 civilians were killed. Hi, my name's Ben. I worked for the United Nations in the Vani in Sri Lanka from 2004, just after the tsunami, until the UN evacuation in September 2008. My name's Lindsay and I'm an illustrator working with Ben on The Vani, which is a graphic novel about the civil war in Sri Lanka and the rippling after effects on a single Tamil family. Benjamin Dix was working with the United Nations and the Norwegian People's Aid in Vani from 2004 to 2008 as the fighting between the Sri Lankan government and the LTTE escalated, he was part of the contingent that was ordered to leave the area by the Sri Lankan government in September 2008. Lindsay is the filmmaker behind the HBO documentary, The One That Got Away, about a Holocaust survivor and will never meet childhood again, about pediatric HIV in Romania. Lindsay Pollock was not available to join us today, but I do want to add that together they are creating a graphic novel titled The Vani that tells the story of a Tamil family living through the horrors of that time from bombing to the internment camps. Benjamin Dix, however, is joining us on Skype today from London. Welcome to the show. Uh, hello, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure having you on and we may as well start off by by finding out what prompted you to, to start this initiative? Um, well, I think when I, when I left Bunny in, in 2008, I'd been there for nearly four years and, uh, and had made such, such strong friends with the, within the community around Kilanochi and, and Mulatibu uh, amongst my staff and, and outside the, the, the UN and NGO world. Um, and, and the, the whole evacuation process and, and then the media blackout uh, after we evacuated was something that really troubled me, that uh, the, the, the Tamil community didn't seem to have this voice of, of um, these horrific events that occurred through 2009. And I really wanted to try and tell the story um, of, of survivors who are now asylum seekers across the world but try and tell them, try and tell that story in a kind of creative and innovative way. And I thought, if you know, we're, we're there's an abundance of official reports of the UN of Amnesty. There, there are fantastic books like uh, Francis's book and films like the Sri Lanka Killing Fields. But I thought that if I created something that um, that a, a wide range of age groups and communities around the world could actually engage with. Uh, that that might be something new and fresh and innovative. So I thought actually a graphic novel that we can all connect with, um, you know, drawings and illustrations and much smaller sound bites through these speech bubbles. Uh, and I thought that might be quite an effective way to try and tell stories of what actually happened in Bunny. Now you were, I mean, your story was featured in Francis Harrison's book, uh, Still Counting the Dead. You were featured as the, um, the aid worker in that story, which was your experience. Tell us a little bit about your time there right before you left in September 2008. Um, well, it, it was, I mean, I, I had had, I got there, I got to Bani two, three days after the tsunami at, in, at the end of 2004, uh, and obviously arrived there in, in a, a very difficult time. Um, 
and then for the next three years, I I I, I just really enjoyed living in in Bunny. I thought it was an absolutely stunning place. I thought the the community were incredibly welcoming, very generous, um, very kind of uh, politically and and globally minded. Um, and then through as the the conflict started to escalate through the end of 2007 and into 2008, um, the situation became more desperate and. You know, it, it it was such a uh, it was such a tragedy to see this 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 uh, this very um, fragile community, but also this this beautiful area being destroyed. Um, and we started to work with the IDPs that were moving from the from the Mulativu and um, and, and Manar district on the borders near Volnia, um, and and starting to work with some of those IDPs that had, had to displace so many times as the army was pushing up behind them. And, and that was really quite harrowing to see these, these communities that were being pushed out of their villages and having to leave in the middle of the night. And, and, uh, and obviously, you know, um, the emergency situation started to, to increase. The last few days before we left were incredibly difficult, trying to work with our staff that weren't able to leave Vani for for, for any number of reasons, um, and 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 then having to say goodbye to some of my my friends there um, was one of the well was by far the most um, traumatic experience of my life. I, I you know, I worked for the UN and and I kind of thought that this was what I'd signed up to do to work in a work in an area and and give protection, witness and and assistance to communities in difficult situations and suddenly having to evacuate when uh, when the situation reached a certain point was was incredibly traumatic for, for myself and my colleagues. What's interesting because when I first heard of this, uh, this, this graphic novel initiative that you and Lindsay are working on, it reminded me of this book that was um, written, it's an autobiographical graphic novel um, about the before and the after of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, titled Persopolis. You've probably heard of it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and I remember reading that and, and thinking, you know, it sort of really gave me a view into things that I wasn't hearing through sort of other outlets. So what are you hoping to achieve with this graphic novel? Well, in a similar way, I mean, my, Persepolis was one of the, uh, I, I, I don't have a background in comics. Lindsay, who unfortunately can't be with us today, he, you know, he's been drawing comics for many years and, and, you know, he's a bit of a geek and kind of likes the, like goes back to the kind of comic times of, of growing up reading comics. But uh, I'm new to this and, and about six, seven years ago, I read Persepolis and I also read um, Joe Sacco's book on Palestine. And these are two conflicts that I didn't know much about in, in Iran and Palestine, not much more than your average kind of, you know, broadsheet newspaper reader. And I found that they, because you're dealing with illustrations and small sound bites of speech bubbles rather than pages and pages of text, you could really kind of start to engage with the characters in the book. And you, you felt something for them as an, as an outsider that had never been to Palestine, never been to Iran. Um, and so with, with our book, The Bunny, I, I you know, I, I want to get this out much past the Tamil uh, audience and out to uh, a, a readership that don't know much about Sri Lanka, that still kind of view Sri Lanka as that place you might go for a honeymoon or your, or your holiday and sit on the beach, but they don't really know about the conflict. And so I thought if we, if we wrap the story up into a story about one Tamil family and the reader gets to know this family and the family consists of, I don't know if you can see, but they're, they're on the wall here behind me, uh, but you can see them on the website um, of, of Anthony, uh, Rajani, Priya, Appama and, and, uh, and the two children. Uh, and if you, you, you'll engage with this family and you'll get to know them and you'll understand that actually they're the same as any other family around the world. They're just born into a time and place which was incredibly difficult to live through. They went through a horrific war and now they're trying to find their place in the world as asylum seekers, as refugees. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, that the, the general reader uh, will, will connect with this and will be able to empathize and sympathize with this story and with this family.
So, I mean, let's get to the characters. Uh, tell us a little bit about the characters and how you're actually going about telling the story. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm working with a group of um, uh, Tamil asylum seekers who have, uh, who have come to, they're, they're, they're all anonymous and, and their names are, are fully confidential and they're giving me their testimonies of the life that they lived through um, before, during and after the conflict. So we start off in 2006 and I'm collecting the testimonies uh, from their life in the bunny. Uh, then, as they had to displace from their home, so our family is based from Champion Patu uh, in Vadamarachi East in Vani, and then how they first displaced and they came down to Paranthan near Kilanochi. Mm -hmm. uh, then, after the UN evacuation, they moved down into the no fire zones one, two, and three and lived through the, the horrors of the conflict. They then went and lived in Manic Farms. Uh, and, and all the, 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 the difficulties and horrors that, that occurred there. They then escaped to Chennai, and in Chennai, the, uh, the remaining family members are in Chennai, while the husband leaves with agents and travels to London as an asylum seeker. And so through these testimonies, these are, these are real stories that people in the Tamil community have lived through, and we set the protagonist, Anthony, who's the husband, in London in the present day of 2012. Uh, and he is an asylum seeker. And we deal with his uh, issues of his identity, of being an asylum seeker in London, um, which I'm sure is very similar to being in Toronto or Paris or Zurich, wherever. Uh, and as he we reflect back on the last six years of his life through conversations with his asylum lawyer and through Skype conversations with his wife in Chennai. Um, and through those conversations with the lawyer and the wife, we, we, we kind of look back on how he got to London. And again, I want the, the, the reader to really understand that you know, this, this guy, Anthony, is someone that you sit next to on the bus in London or in Toronto or in Paris. It's someone you might walk past on the street. And I don't know how the situation is there in Toronto, but, you know, there are many issues surrounding asylum seekers here in the UK that the British public often look at them as, as a threat to these are people that come over and they want to take our jobs or, or um, you know, for financial reasons. Uh, that's why they come to England. And I want them to really maybe try and challenge that view that Anthony actually doesn't want to be in England. He would quite like to be back on his beach in Sri Lanka in the bunny as a fisherman. Um, and being here isn't, isn't uh, part of his life plan, but circumstances and global politics has meant that he's here. And these are the kind of things that I really want to challenge in, uh, the reader in the book. Was but all the, oh, sorry. Go what? ahead. No, I was going to say that actually it's interesting that you say that, that view of the asylum seeker. It's true that that in itself needs some illumination. The idea that the person that's sitting next to you on the bus could have this, this, this bigger story behind them, right? Exactly. And, and you know, I mean, this story, the, the bunny is set, in, is set as a, a story about Sri Lanka. But I actually wanted the, the reader to, to kind of think outside the box. And it's not just Sri Lanka. I'm using Sri Lanka because... I have the Sri Lanka connection. I was working there for so long and I have many, uh, you know, friends within the community and I want to tell their story. Mm -hmm. But actually, the story of the asylum seeker could be a Somali, it could be a, a, a guy from Zimbabwe or Bangladesh or wherever. Afghanistan, th this is a global problem um, which Sri Lanka represents, you know. Interesting. So, I mean, I know that you're looking to, you're just starting off on the project or you've been working on it for two years and, and I know that you're also looking for funds to get this, um, get this finished. Perhaps you can speak about that. Yeah, I mean, Lindsay and I have been working on this for about uh, a year and a bit, about the, you know, 14, 15 months now. And we've been building the project and conceptualizing it, how we're going to tell these stories and doing the research behind it. And that we've we've completely funded ourselves, but you know, living here in London is uh, is, is it's expensive, and and this is a full time job. You know, all the drawings are hand drawn, and and the amount of research and interviews that we have to do, it's it's very much a full time project. 
So now we're trying to gather some funds together uh, to be able to produce the project for the next two years um, and, and deliver a chapter every three or four months online um, that people will be able to engage with. So we've started at the moment a Kickstarter uh, fundraising initiative, which uh, runs, I think, for the next 40 days, 4-0. I, it finishes in January 13th. And we're trying to gather funds through various communities and, and audiences to be able to fund us, to be able to work for the next uh, year, year and a half on this project and produce something that, you know, really has great quality and 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 has a place in the world for a, a large readership to, to to engage with what's that website again benjamin the kickstarter one do you have the uh, link with you uh, well, if you go to our we, we've produced a preview of the vanny book which you can go to www.thevanny.co.uk and from there you can see uh, on the front page uh, kickstarter.com uh, and, and that's where you, you, you go to, to help fund the project. Perfect. Well, we'll definitely add it to our Facebook page. And I know that um, if you go and Google, I believe the Avani project, you can find it as well because I was researching it before I got a chance to speak to you. So I, I know that our audience would be interested in, in hearing about that. So how do you, um, I mean, I'm trying to understand what it's like to, to gather these survivor stories. What are some of the challenges that you run into well, they're, you know, like uh, I'm sure Francis said, they're, they're incredibly difficult and emotional um, testimonies to gather. Uh, and for me personally, as the author of this book, um, it, it, it's a very difficult thing for me to gather because, you know, I was part of the UN system that evacuated from Bunny. And therefore, I also come with, you know, uh, I, I have a sense of, of guilt and abandonment as, as we left uh, Vani in 2008 and I had to say goodbye to these friends. Um, and so sitting in London, Zurich, uh, Chennai now and, and, and researching um, this book, is, is it, it's really difficult to hear some of these stories. Um, then the challenge is to gather those testimonies and turn them into a narrative um, that, like I said, a wider readership will read. Um, so, so I have to, you know, myself and Lindsay, we're not Tamil. I didn't live through the conflict. I didn't lose family members. I don't know what it's like to go through the, that experience. So one of the challenges is to lessen my voice. I will write the overarching narrative, but I want the, the, the Tamil respondents that I work with to actually fill in the, all the gaps. So it makes it, you know, culturally very specific and all the nuances are just right and they don't come from me they come from people who actually live through the conflict and and i think that's what hopefully will make it a really special book that you know i'm in a position to write the book but they're in a position to actually give me the material now when you in your interaction with these with these survivors i mean are you finding that there's a how do you establish that trust to get the story even though you are providing some anonymity there must be that that barrier that you have to get past. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess now because I've, you know, I've been, I, I gave my personal testimony on the Sri Lanka Killing Fields film, mm -hmm. uh, and also in Francis's book, I was on the the BBC the other week when the UN report came out. So, I guess you know, within the Tamil community, there's um, a certain trust that people know who I am and, and I've spoken out on behalf of, of, of the community. Um, so there, there's a kind of trust that's already established there. Um, and then I guess a, a lot of the people that I'm working with are people that I knew from when I was in the bunny. So they know who I am um, or they're friends of friends or whatever. So I, m most of the people I'm working with, there's, there's a kind of personal connection with already, which kind of overcomes a lot of the hurdles. Um, but then you have to take these things incredibly slowly, be very patient, um, because these are, you know, some of the most terrific personal stories that people are going to ever tell you. And, and that's difficult for them telling me and for me to absorb those stories is, um, you know, so, some, some tears are being shed through this project. It's, it's a difficult one to work on.
So, you know, I always wondered, um, and, I, and I unfortunately didn't get a chance to ask Francis this question, so I'll ask you, do you, do you get a sense from these survivors, um, and you may not have an answer to this, but do you get a sense from the survivors about the, the feelings that they have either about the international community, the UN, the Tamil diaspora, or the government, any of those? Do you get any of that, or do they simply focus on their own stories? No, they... That a lot of this stuff comes out that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of anger and confusion, um, especially at the international community, that, um, you know, it, it, the, the, the situation was uh, able to get to such a horrific um, uh, point. Um, there, there was confusion of why the, the, the UN ab abandoned them and, and, and left in, in September 2008. Um, I think within the bunny there was often um, uh, some some divide between people living in the bunny and the diaspora um, who look at conflict from different perspectives. Right, people are living through it and people are watching it from afar. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, some of this stuff does come out. Um, but actually, I mean, what mostly comes out is is a lot of trauma and and a lot of it's still very recent. You know, it's Lindsay as you as you introduced him. You know, did a, a project on the Holocaust. Now that's sixty years ago, so people have time to to absorb that trauma and time to to go through it. And there's been so many narratives and films and books and documentaries written and and produced on that. This is still very raw. It's two thousand and nine, so we're you know it's three years ago. Um, and and that sense of, of emotion is still there, and it's it's still there within me as well. It's um, you know th th this is a new thing, and maybe in years to come it gets easier to to work on projects like this. But at the moment, it's it, it's pretty raw and difficult, as Frut would have found as well. Do you find? I mean, it's been interesting because I, I see that in the last. I mean, I know that these people have been working on it for a while, but it just seems like even on the show, we've had a couple of people that are, I would say, you know, non-Tamils that are telling stories. We've had, you know, we were talking to you now. We have, we have Francis Harrison. We also t um, spoke to the director of uh, Silenced Vo Voices, Bieti. So do you think that there is some momentum here around telling stories? Or do you think it's just a coincidence that all of these are sort of breaking at the same time? Um, well, again, it takes time to produce these kind of things, and and you know it it is new. It's it, it, two thousand nine wasn't that long ago, and the 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 people the survivors of that conflict are now kind of you know two thousand nine they're in at the end of the war manic farms two thousand ten they're manic farms maybe Chennai two thousand eleven they're coming into Europe Canada uh, wherever and two thousand twelve we start working on these projects. Yeah. So I think that's actually quite. You know, it's quite clear that we're, we're all starting to work on these. But I think between myself, Francis, Beatty, Callum, it's been uh, such a... It's a very different conflict, this one, because it was such a media blackout. And, you know, to go back to your past question, some of... A lot of the community that I'm working with and uh, the individuals are very upset, as I was, that you see in the news every day things that are happening in Syria, in Libya, in Afghanistan, in, 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 in uh, Iraq. But no one talks about Sri Lanka. I had my hair cut the other day for this interview. And, uh, and uh, the, you know, my barber was, my, my hairdresser was talking about he was going on his honeymoon to Sri Lanka and has absolutely no idea about the war. He heard about something about Tamil Tigers and whatever, but doesn't have any understanding how horrific it was. And... So I think for the group of inter internationals that I'm working with, like Francis, BT, Callum, etc., we feel that there's a great unjust in this. And it was such a brutal conflict. So many lives were lost. And the media didn't really pick up on this. The international community failed in this conflict. And those stories need to be told. You know, that history needs to be written down, whether it's a film, a book, a graphic novel. Um, Otherwise, you know, those those 30 friends that I lost and the, 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 the people that I'm working with now, their stories deserve to be told. Otherwise, they're, they're lost to, to history. And that, that's, that, that doesn't sit well with me. Fair enough. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you.
Thanks very much, Pat. And we hope to we hope to see this go into production and have you back when it's a finished product. I really look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. We will take All a break right. now. On our next segment, you'll see our pre-recorded interview with Francis Harrison, author of Still Counting the Dead, Survivors of Sri Lanka's Hidden War. Stay with us. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Savaraja. <laughs> Welcome to a special interview with Frances Harrison on TVI. Ms. Harrison is the author of Still Counting the Dead, a harrowing account of the last months of the 2009 war in Sri Lanka between the Sri Lankan government forces and the Liberation Tigers of Tamililam that claimed between 40,000 to possibly over 140,000 lives. Now, in saying those numbers, uh, we at Crossroads certainly do not want to sound trite. Um, why we're co quoting both of those numbers is because a UN panel, panel um, has pegged the number at 40,000, while the Bishop of Mannar has gone on record to say that, the, that there are 147,000 people that um, in the area that are unaccounted for, which probably explains the name of Miss Harrison's book. And now let's say a little bit about Frances Harrison. She has worked as a foreign correspondent for the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, in South Asia, Southeast Asia and Iran, including four years in Sri Lanka, and also as the head of news at Amnesty International. A Cambridge, Cambridge graduate and formerly a visiting research fellow at Oxford, she joins us in the studio to talk about her book. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So I made some assumptions about why the book was titled that, and definitely in reading your book, um, this is it here, Still Counting the Dead, um, I, I saw that phrase repeated a couple of times. Perhaps you can explain the title to us. Yes, of course, it's about the fact that there is no death toll, that it could be, you know, we can't even round up to the nearest tens of thousands of people, and that's an extraordinary shock, really, in this day and age, that you don't know how many people died in a conflict. And also it was about making the dead count for something because that was really what the motivation was of all the survivors who very bravely spoke to me. They wanted the people who never made it out to count for something, to matter, to mean something. And so they took this extraordinary step of talking to me about things that they'd really rather forget and that it was very, very painful because they wanted to make those people matter and count for something. And, it, and it, I think that there was a testimonial that someone wrote about your book that said the same thing, that you're trying to make these people more than just numbers, actual, actual, you know, bring the humanity back to them. So again, what prompted you to write this book? <laughs> You've been uh, asked that a million times, I'm no, sure. No, I mean, it's a really complicated story in a way. I mean, obviously I lived in Sri Lanka for four years mm -hmm. and I was there during the peace process time and I visited the Vani a lot and I knew those people quite well. It's a small area. So I was unusual in terms of correspondence that I happened to be there at the right time to you know, check out the place and get to know the tigers. And then I went on to another job. I went to Iran and I then went back to London and I kind of, you know, it was a bit behind me. But then Sri Lankan journalists who I'd known in Colombo started becoming refugees in England and I got to know them again. And throughout the war, the last phase of the war, I talked to one of the senior tigers on Skype. And it kind of left its mark on me and I waited after the war. I mean, obviously I watched Pully Devon being killed in the white flag incident, surrendering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was upsetting having talked to him. But I sort of thought it wasn't my problem and somebody else would deal with it. And I waited to see what the world would do about it. And, you know, a year went by and really there was nothing. There was the UN Human Rights Council that congratulated Sri Lanka. And then I happened to meet an old friend who was an academic who'd just written a book about the liberation struggle in Bangladesh, kind of revisiting it on both sides. And I, the penny dropped and I thought, OK, as just one person, one individual, with the skill set I have, the very least I can do is try and tell the story of what happened, this sort of black hole, this gap in history where nobody witnessed what happened from outside. And I decided that's what I would do. And um, the more I dug into you know, research, I read everything that was out there, I watched everything I could find, the more shocked I was at the sort of extraordinary twists and turns. You know, when I discovered that some of the senior military generals who'd been you know, conducting the war were actually now diplomats abroad, you know, I was sort of staggered and I just went from there. And the journalists in exile, Tamil and Singhalese that I knew, helped me find people. And I found the first person and then they introduced me to somebody else and then someone else. So I traveled throughout Europe and I went to Australia, where even the stories were more shocking in Australia because of the boat journeys abroad. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I think the first story, the first woman I interviewed was the mother in my book. And I just, my eyes popped out of my head when I heard some of the things she said. And I, had, I didn't think that it, I thought it would just be that six months of war. I hadn't really banked on what the story would be in Manic Farm refugee camp or internment camp. I didn't realize that the escape stories would be so dramatic that people would be crawling under barbed wire with their children and hiding and, you know, bribing their way out of the country and then going through human smugglers and going all around the world and sort of dicing with being caught all the time. So I, I sort of got two stories for one, as it were, and <laughs> gradually realized that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. I got so tell us about some of the people, like who were some of the people that you interviewed for the book? Well, I interviewed, a white, well, I interviewed a lot more than are in the book. Obviously, there are people who, who I didn't put in the book because I couldn't fit them all in. But I interviewed, you know, a teacher, a doctor, a fighter, which I didn't think I would get initially, but I did. And um, a person who was disabled in a wheelchair, which, you know, going through a war like that is pretty difficult. I actually interviewed a girl who was blind as well, who went through the war, but she was really very traumatized. And it was quite difficult to get enough to write a whole story. I interviewed... Um, a whole range of different people who, um, who in a way were interesting because they told me how they were happy before the war really kicked in and what they lost. And um, all of them illustrated quite different things. Initially, I thought I would do a, a long chronology of, you know, this happened on this date and then this thing and so on. And I realized that actually a lot of people couldn't remember the dates of each attack. And the things that stuck in their mind were not, you know, particular shell attack on a particular date. It was just that they were sitting with their best friend having a cup of tea and the a shell landed and killed the person in front of them. And it was really the journey of an individual through war that actually told you why it was interesting and why you should care. Now, you, when we, we were out in the lobby chatting about this, you shared the story about how um, there were certain common themes that you found when you met these, these people that had escaped from the war zone and, and are living abroad, perhaps. Perhaps you can share that, because I found it very, um, very interesting to hear. Well, I found, you know, these were really broken, smashed up people. I mean, many of them were suicidal, have been suicidal, very, very deeply troubled and traumatized. Some of them whispered their stories. Some of them cried when I, you know, even just asked them to tell me what happened to them. Some of them didn't cry, and you thought, why are they not crying? They're so stony-faced when they're discussing these really horrific things. So the reactions were, were very extreme. One woman in Dublin just shook the whole way through the interview. She's not in the book, but it was just dreadful. And she was sort of, she was so skeletal. She was like Edvard Munch's scream picture. And she was with her family. Mm -hmm. And the family were all really plump. And you, know, you couldn't tell they were the, from the same family or the same kind of species, really. It was very shocking. And the curtain behind her shook too. And it was very distressing. And my translator was a young Tamil man who, who was really distressed, I think, too, watching her. But I think overall... When I look at those people, I found um, the, the houses were very bare and empty. And yes, they were recent refugees and they were living in state housing, most people. And, you know, they, like, for example, the mother, her house was completely bare. I mean, there was nothing much except a portrait of her dead husband and a candle burning underneath it. And there was no sort of attempt to make it homely and... You know, it's spotlessly clean and beautiful, it ran, but it just, there was no personal touches. Why do you think that is? I started, I mean, I started feeling this atmosphere of sort of, it was inert, it was dead. It was almost as if they were recreating the, the, the feelings in their head outside, or maybe it was a sense of sort of impermanence and not really living in the present, because many of them said, look, I'm really half living in Sri Lanka still, mm. and are not wanting to put down roots to a sort of resentment about being displaced like that. But I think, you know, I started taking flowers and plants to these people when I went for interviews because I needed to see some signs of life there. It was odd. And I started, you know, you develop strange habits in response to the things you see. I started wanting to wear kind of bright colors, things that were cheerful, you know, pink clothes, because again, you want to kind of be an antidote to that mm -hmm. death and destruction that is around. That's uh, very, very hard to even hear. So tell us the story. I mean, there was one story when I read the, uh, the book, there's one story that stuck out for me, the, the story of the doctor. I was hoping that you could share that with our audience. Uh, he's an incredible man. I mean, he's, he's a hero for me. He's really incredible. You know, he, you wouldn't imagine, he just looks like anybody. And no, he lives in a country in Europe where he doesn't tell anybody there who he is, what he did. And he's completely anonymous. And yet, you know, he's a guy who, part of a team of, of doctors, nurses, medics, volunteers, who saved 20,000 lives. And, you know, he gave his own blood to save a girl's life at one point. Um, 
he thought he would die. He sent his family off in a ship after his wife was injured and he stayed in these hospitals. And he, the last time he slept in a bed, you know, proper night's sleep was, I think, December 2008. And he just would have naps sitting upright in the armchair. He trained his medics because, I mean, they had so many dying people to operate on, to do surgery on. They couldn't, they had to make life and death choices, who was going to live and who was going to die. And he trained his medics and his volunteers to prepare the patients for surgery, sort of clean the wounds or whatever, or open it up so that it was ready for him to do. And he did a lot of bowel surgery. And then he trained another one to sew them up afterwards. So and they just, were not doctors per se, just... Well, I think chewing. they were sort of fairly trained, you know, okay. but <laughs> yeah. to be able to do that. But he worked out this sort of conveyor belt system so that he'd be in the middle, they'd be preparing the patient for, for the surgery, and then this one would be stitching them up, and they would just go through so they c could operate on more people. I mean, it was incredible. And in, and in dismal conditions, because in your book you say they, they didn't really have anesthetic. They, they, they ran out of anesthetic, they ran out of antibiotics, the hospitals were being deliberately targeted. I mean, what I've written about is the fact that he had 12 sites that he dealt with. I mean, not hospitals, they were school buildings. You've seen the pictures, I'm sure. Um, residential homes, tents, they had the admissions section was in a tent. And uh, he, he told the ICRC, the Red Cross, International Red Cross, that this is the new site for the hospital and they would paint red crosses on the top and they would send the GPS positions. And of those seven that he declared to the ICRC who passed the information on to the army. I'm and the happy. ICRC being the International, International Committee of the Red Cross. Red Cross and, yeah. you know, basically in wars, what you do is you declare a humanitarian site or a hospital and you give the GPS positions. And then the other side doesn't hit the hospital. Irrelevant of whether it's got soldiers in or anything like that. It's just you don't hit hospitals. It's the laws of war. And he found with those seven sites that he declared within hours or days, they were hit and they were, he learned. And he just said the last, the five of them, he didn't give the permission, positions of, and they were never hit. So he concluded that they were deliberately hitting hospitals. And that's what the UN panel report says. And that's what Human Rights Watch and ICRC have documented over 30 cases of attacks on hospitals. And when I started to realize that when I was researching, you know, I'd assumed that they were accidental, these attacks on hospitals. They were sort of carelessness, if you like. Mm -hmm. But it became apparent that you just can't accidentally hit 30 hospitals like that or hit hospitals 30 times. It's just not possible. So, you know, for me, we, it was bizarre because the last time I saw him, I had this, you know, I asked him to tell me in sort of graphic detail that how it was on the day he left the war zone and he was the last one to leave. The other doctors left first. And it was obviously extremely painful for him to talk about that time. And he really told me about how he left 150 patients under a tree. And for him, that was, you know, the failure that he can't get over, the personal sort of failure. So um, despite the fact that he did, he stayed and he saved so many lives, he focuses on the 150. Yeah, he can't get past that. Mm -hmm. And you can understand why. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not what a doctor does, I suppose. But it was either he would die with them or he would have a chance of life. And, you know, he had to leave. And those were people who couldn't walk out. You know, they were left in rags and, you know, injured with no medicine, with flies everywhere and rotting corpses around. It was horrific. And, you know, we had this argument where I said to him kind of, but, you know, for me, you did more than anybody. I can't imagine a doctor doing as much as you did. And, you know, how can you blame yourself? How can you feel guilty? You went way beyond the call of duty. You know, you, you, you weren't paid. You were threatened. You were told to leave. You let, sent your family off. You had no contact with them. You could have died any minute. You risked your own life. You'd never thought about yourself to save other people. I mean, how many doctors would do that? Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, 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 I, I agree with you that I did my duty, but not what happens if I meet this woman? And I'm like, which woman? And he says, well, on the way out, after the, leaving the 150 patients under a tree, my assistant, and, and the assistant disappeared at the end of the war too, so that's another tragedy for him. My assistant and I found this woman, she was tending to her husband who was really badly injured, I think, you know, leg kind of hit by something and couldn't move. And she begged us and begged us to carry him out. And, she, and he said, I talked to my assistant and I asked him, could we, you know, can we do it somehow? And the guy said, no, there's no way we can carry the man out. And they begged the woman to leave him because she was gonna die if she stayed there. There were so many bullets flying around and she, you know, very loyally stayed with her husband. And, and that was a time when, when a lot of families abandoned the injured. I mean, it's shameful and horrible, but the instinct kicks in to survive. And, and it was really a horrible, horrible choice. And he said to me, you know, what happens if I ever meet that woman again? How can I ever look her in the eye and say that, you know, I did my duty because I abandoned her? So, you know, you can, he's it's such a decent guilt. Man. Oh, everybody has survivor's guilt. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. But for him, that woman haunts him and the 150 patients. He can't focus on what the huge amount that he achieved.
Interesting. Well, we have a lot more to talk about, so you're going to stay with us, Francis. Uh, we're going to take a break now. Stay with us. You're watching an interview with Francis Harrison, author of Still Counting the Dead on TVI. Welcome back. We've been speaking to Francis Harrison, author of Still Counting the Dead. So um, you've just spoken to about spoken to it about, us about this doctor, and you know one of the frustrations that people in the in the diaspora have is actually with the UN, uh, because they feel that everything that's come out of the UN um, has either been sort of a lack lack of real action or these watered down resolutions, mm -hmm. and then the the Petri report comes out from the UN, and this is a report that was a review of the actions of the UN in 2009 in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and it is critical. <laughs> so it's critical of the UN's actions or inaction, whichever way you look at it. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this report? I think I share their frustration. Um, I read the report the first time, and I was quite excited by it. You know, I thought, wow, this is explosive stuff, and you know, it's quite vindicating. It's the same sort of things I wrote about in my chapter on the UN and I thought, wow, this is good. It's not a whitewash. It's a really competent and honest kind of internal inquiry. And then I, after a day or two, I read it again and I, and you know, it's a fairly bureaucratically written, you know, kind of UN report, lots of acronyms and so on. And, and it's not sort of dramatic reading. I read it again and I felt intensely angry, actually. I felt really upset by it. And, you know, I found it really difficult to read because it's really hard to accept that, um, that people, in a sense, suppressed information about casualties and... People in the UN. People in the UN, senior mm -hmm. officials. Although clearly at the bottom end, you know, there were kind of lower ranking UN officials who were very brave. And, and the Tamil staff who stayed in the war zone or had to stay in the war zone, they, were, they continued to work. It says they worked to a point of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those who sort of blew the whistle, resigned, stood up for what they thought was right, that was a very difficult thing. They, you know, they trash their careers in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see a few people who are, do the right thing, but on the whole, the senior guys, you know, you, it's very disturbing the role they played. So, yeah, I felt very upset about it. And that seems to be sort of the feeling that, that you know, we hear from sort of calls or discussions. We just did a show on that report, mm -hmm. and it was what the feedback that we got from people that had watched the show as well. So, given that, you know, what kind of um, sort of dealings do you think the Tamil diaspora? I'm just curious about your opinion. I know you are a, um, a teller of a story, you're a chronicler, but as an outside observer, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're definitely interested in hearing your opinion. What do you think the Canadian Tamil diaspora, or just the international National Tamil diaspora ought to be doing, be it the UN or just when it comes to 2009? Well, I mean, in a very basic sense, I think the diaspora has to look back at the last, you know, 20, 30 years of, well, even before that peaceful democratic struggle for Tamil rights and then armed struggle, violence and so on, and look at why it's, it ended in catastrophe in 2009. I mean, there has to be a review and a rethink of what has gone so terribly wrong. It's not enough just to blame the outside world, although I totally understand why that's the case and why people want to do that, especially with the, what we've just now, now know and have mm -hmm. corroborated about the UN. But you know, you're living in a world where you have to understand you know, the international climate and what is and isn't possible. And to say that the world should be different and treat you differently is is not really going to get very far, get very far. So I think a rethink, a kind of re-strategization, you know, thinking what you actually want to achieve now and abandoning violence and finding a way of engaging and, and actually telling people what happened is also still really important. I think the vast majority of, of non-Tamils or non-Sri Lankans don't really know what happened in 2009. So different kinds of ways of communicating with people in a way that they're going to listen. I mean, you are very much tainted by the LTT label and the terrorism label, and it makes it very difficult for people to engage with actually what happened in 2009, unfortunately. But you have to find a way of expressing this to people. I, don't, I mean, I'm not really telling you the answer. I'm telling you the problem, I the think. The problem. Well, it's yeah. interesting because, um, you know, there was a part in your book where you relate the story of someone you spoke to, one of, one of the folks in the war zone that you interviewed once she had escaped. And she tells the story about, and she hadn't cried at all throughout her dealings mm -hmm. with, with you. And then she tells a story about how there was some sad story about a cat or a kitten. Mm -hmm. And it had been submitted, you know, that video had gone viral. People all over the world had shared it. And she started crying mm -hmm. when she couldn't understand why the similar attention hadn't been paid mm -hmm. to, to what had happened in Sri Lanka in 2009. 
Why do you think that is? Why do you think that that people didn't pay attention or, or still don't? I mean, she had an absolutely good point. You know, people were so worked up about a cat being mistreated and thousands of people were dying and nobody cared. Yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, I think it's, you know, at all sorts of levels, it was to do with the post 9-11 environment in which we lived. And, you know, this was branded as a war on terror and, P and the LTT were prescribed all over the world. And so that skewed the reporting of what happened and the mindset and outlook of, of governments all over the world. And you see that very clearly in the Petri report that UN diplomats told the what you know member states what they wanted to hear which was that the terrorists were the bad ones and they were the doing the killing and then when it turned out that actually the majority of killing was by the government they found it very difficult to square that with what their expectations were and i think the un obviously set the tone for the wider reporting of this war and it's we're still seeing the ripples of that effect you know in the way that some of the questions i get asked when i go for media interviews and so on by canadians or other people who are not you know sri lankan and so that's one aspect of it you know, how did so many people get killed and we still don't know how many and, and nobody know about it? I mean, partly, you know, Sri Lanka isn't Gaza or Syria. It doesn't have that ripple effect on the whole, you know, region. It's mm -hmm. only really India that keeps an eye on what goes on and maybe China now, but, you know, it doesn't have a huge impact. And then I think it's that it's an island. It's a, it's a quirk of geography that, you know, people couldn't get in and access those war zones in the way that they did in Syria. You know, Mary That's Calvin, right, because you can people. cross borders. That's right. And yeah. the refugees didn't pour out to another country and tell horrible stories of what had happened to them. Which is what is happening in Syria. Which is right exactly now. what's happening in Syria. Yeah. So you didn't have that. And, you know, it's a very complicated war and there's not that many kind of obvious heroes or good guys. And, and the world finds it very difficult to understand you know, who's, who's good and who's bad, and it's not simple. And, and I think they've sort of switched off on the, on the, mentally on the complexity of the story too, which, mm -hmm. you know, unless you get that right, and it is really, really complicated. It is very complicated. And you have to yeah. struggle with that. And even if you, like me, you've lived there for a long time, it's still very difficult to know who to believe and what, what you really think about something. So those factors somewhat influence it. But yeah, it's, it's just not really um, got attention in a way that it should. Because if you look at the scale of death, I mean, the UN panel report said 40,000. This last Petri report says possibly 70,000 dead mm -hmm. in five, six months. And, you know, the bishops talked about a larger number and it may well be. I mean, you know, if you look at the population data, it is really worrying the questions it raises in terms of missing people. Mm -hmm. And where in the world in the last few decades have you had that many civilians killed you know, in this kind of, you know, violence by a, an army or a government rather than sort of, you know, small incidents like in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's one of the worst atrocities in terms of the space of time that it took place, you know, five, six months or really only four months perhaps at the end. And the tiny weeny geography, you know, that place is so, so small. Mm -hmm. And you're sending heavy artillery into this tiny bit of land. I mean, what, and people sheltering, not even in buildings, in tents and ditches mm -hmm. of course the, the scale of loss of life is huge and so this is something that's you know really um, unfathomable in its horror and uh, it's amazing that it hasn't got more publicity and I think you know the people I meet who have met survivors and talked to them and interviewed them who are very very few because not many survivors want to do that but the people I do meet who've done that there's a kind of bond in the sense that we see this see it the same you know it's just a life-changing experience to sit there and talk to one of these people who's been through this you just cannot see this war in, a diff in the same way again Interesting. I actually had a similar experience when I read your book because I was I was meeting these survivors through your words, and I think that's why it's important. I think the survivor stories are, are very important, um, which brings me to my next question. Actually, and I know again that we've discussed that you are a, a chronicler. You're you know, and you you've always said you're not a policymaker by any means. Mm. But what do you think the international community ought to be doing for Sri Lanka or in Sri Lanka? Going well, forward. I think that there's no way this country can move on from this war unless there is some sort of truth telling about what happened in 2009. And of course, there's, you know, waves, all the people in 2009 have been through lots of displacement and, and killing and misery before. And the Sinhalese and the Muslims, I'm not denying, you know, the things that they went through as well. This is a very you know, particular slice of history, I've told. But I don't think you can move forward after 40,000 odd deaths or whatever it is. And just sort of say to people, put that behind you and, you know, redevelop the country and, and worry about the future. You just can't expect people who are so traumatized to do that. And you can't expect the country just to sort of live through denial like that. So 
I think there has to be an acknowledgement of what happened. I mean, as the nun in my book put it, you know, there's forgiveness. Everyone wants forgiveness and reconciliation, but how can you have that without acknowledging what, what you're forgiving or what happened in the first place? Uh, I think that this process of, of documenting and the testimony of the survivors and establishing what really happened and who is responsible has to happen in some way, and I don't see it happening in Sri Lanka, as you can see in the last three and a half years, and I can't see how it's ever going to happen in this environment. So I think it has to be... A, external process that does that. So I would say that, you know, the call from every human rights group that's out there that's and the UN panel report for a, an independent mm -hmm. international inter investigation into war crimes is important. And obviously war crimes means both sides. Mm -hmm. And that cry seems to be getting louder. I mean, recently I've seen, I think, an article in The Economist, you know, which I would say can be conservative, right? And I've seen you write, I think you wrote a piece in the, in the Globe and Mail too about this, but I, I'm seeing that echoed a, a few more times. Well, it's a cry in the wilderness, <laughs> maybe. Okay. I mean, you know, look at the, the actual kind of process in Geneva at the Human Rights Council. It's not about war crimes. In the UPR session, the human rights session uh, recently, mm -hmm. nobody really mentioned war crimes. You know, the word doesn't get used, although, I mean, people were more critical of the government of Sri Lanka, but the resolution in March was about implementing the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, whose mandate was which not is the to Sri Lanka's own Sri Lanka's Sri Lanka government's own accountability solution, which whose mandate was not to look at, at war crimes. It was to look at what went wrong with the peace process, mm -hmm. and to, and it suggested some quite sensible things about human rights to improve the situation for all Sri Lankans, which is you know everybody supported those bits, but where are they? Do you think it still makes sense to keep engaging with the UNHRC? For the yes, I think, I think, you know, certainly human rights activists who have, you know, whilst they have high standards of what they expect from countries, also, you know, have a realistic sense of what's possible in the environment that we live in. They felt that that was very important, that the resolution in March kind of put on record expectations from the government in Sri Lanka, set a process in motion for the first time. So although it would be very disappointing for many people in terms of its remit and the, with the language being quite sort of mild, mm -hmm. they still felt that it was a very significant step. So I think it needs supporting. And the important thing is that this coming March, when there's a, you know they report back and when the, the council has to decide what to do, that it shouldn't just be left to drop, it should continue in some way. Otherwise, really, I think the the quest for justice for the survivors will be set back years and years, if not yes. decades. Interesting. Well, yours, uh, your book is a fantastic document that, that helps people understand a little bit more. Where can, where can people get this? I know I read it as an e-book um, <laughs> that I got off of Kobo, which is something that's well known in Canada. Uh -huh. Where else can people get this right now? Well, in Canada, it's published by House of Anansi, and it's on Amazon.com, you know, and on e-book. And it's also published in the UK primarily, because obviously that's where I live. Mm -hmm. And it's published in India um, on Penguin India as an English edition. And there so soon will be the Tamil edition um, launched in Chennai and a singular translation. So I hope that people in Sri Lanka will read it in Singular. Oh, that's great. So it will be available in both um, Singular and Tamil. I'm yep. thinking by the new year then. Uh, the Tamil edition will be launched, I think, around the 15th of December in Chennai, and I'm going for that, okay. and to Delhi and Chennai. And I hope the Singular edition around the same time. The guy who's translating it, it's got a bit slow, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. And, and the Singular yeah, edition will more or less give, give away free to anybody you know, who can get it on the internet and, okay. and hope that at a certain level, Singlies will read these stories and connect as human beings with the other side, as it were. And that's what the hope is. Thank you so much, Francis, for joining us. It's been Thank a you. pleasure having you here. I wanted to end by reading this um, sort of a brief uh, piece from her book. And she's actually mentioned it in what she just said about the story. And when I was reading the book, I mean, all of the stories were powerful. This, I just couldn't, this morning, I couldn't get the story of this doctor out of my head. And, and Frances herself has said that this doctor was a hero to her as well. So here it is, and this is right out of the book. Pieces of shrapnel narrowly missed him as he operated in makeshift field hospitals. He's convinced they were deliberately attacked, even though he repeatedly gave the Sri Lankan government details of their position so they'd be spared. He calculates that his team of doctors and nurses and medics saved at least 20,000 people, but he's tormented by 150 patients he abandoned under a tree on the very last day of the war. So there you have it. Francis's book, Still Counting the Dead, is available in paperback and also as an e-book. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Francis Harrison on a special interview on TVI.
That's our show for today. Thank you all for joining us. You've been watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. Tamil Indian Bob, Uncle TV.